Here, for those of you who are interested in Asian art, is a wonderful symbol of a time when Afghanistan was not, as it sometimes is presented at the moment, perceived as a charity case. This is a symbol of a time when Afghanistan was, in fact, the capital of an empire that stretched, roughly speaking, from Delhi to Baghdad, a very, very major Muslim civilization of the late 12th century. These domes in a place called Chiste Sharif, this one has been hit by a Russian tank shell, are, it appears, mausoleum, under which are buried the Chistia Dervish, Muslim missionaries who carried Islam into India in the 12th century. They are the products, very rare products, along with the Qutb Minar in Delhi, which some of you may have seen in Delhi, and this building here, which is called the Minaret of Jam, signs of an extraordinary flourishing of Afghan power, a very improbable flourishing of Afghan power. As many of you are aware, Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran, in the 11th century, in the 12th century, in the 13th century, tended to be dominated by steppe nomadic people, by people with horses. So uh, firstly, the Turkic groups who took over the Persian Empire, and then of course, Genghis Khan, who uh, with his Mongols swept down and dominated land right the way through to Poland. This dynasty though was an indigenous Afghan dynasty. It's not quite clear what they were, what they were ethnically, whether they were Turkic or uh, Persian speaking, but they certainly seem in the 12th century to have based themselves in the central mountains of Afghanistan and very improbably destroyed the Ghaznavid Turks and created this extraordinary empire. The empire lasted a very short period, just a matter of decades, but it's left behind this minaret. And this minaret is very striking because around the shaft of the tower, you can see the Miriam Surah of the Quran. It's a surah about Mary, the mother of Jesus, written in a very distinctive Kufic Islamic lettering. And in turquoise blue tiles around the neck, you can see the name of the man who built it, Sultan Giyasuddin Ghori ibn Sam. And for scale, that's a horse at the bottom of the minaret. So this thing is about 160 feet high. It's a huge, huge object. And it appears to be, as far as one can tell, the last relic of a capital city, probably destroyed by the Mongol armies in the early 13th century. Certainly when I arrived there, at the beginning of 2002, there was very extensive excavation going on around the site. I didn't take as many photographs as I should have done. Um, this is a photograph, in fact, taken in a village further up the river. But all around the site, all around these hills, were people digging, often 30 feet into the ground, and removing very, uh, very valuable objects. I was recently in somebody's house in the Middle East, and he showed me two gold amulets, and written on the gold amulets was Sultan Giyasuddin Ghori ibn Sam. These objects were almost certainly excavated at the end of 2001, beginning of 2002. I'm pretty sure I know the man who actually dug them up. Uh, he sold them for not a great deal of money, and they then found their way to a trader in Peshawar in Pakistan. The man who I met in the Middle East had bought them for $135,000 in Pakistan. But of course, the villagers who are excavating are often just getting a dollar or two at a time. And it's this kind of activity, and perhaps we can talk more about this in the questions, these kinds of illegal activity ranging from drug growing to um, illegal looting of antiquities, which is a predictable way of generating income in a society in which security and government authority is not fully established. Those bangles, for example, just anecdotally have been taken from the wrists of skeletons. The village has been excavating a grave site around the edge of their village and removing these, these bronze bangles. And finally, the Taliban. This is a photograph taken in February 2002 of a village called Shaidan. For about four and a half days, every village I walked through had been abandoned and, in many cases, demolished stone by stone to the ground. This is a market town which had about 150 shops in it. 
Every single shop abandoned, all the roof beams, the poplar roof beams burnt and charred, the inside neatly rendered in soot, and all the inhabitants of this town living in a refugee camp on the Iranian border. Very, very striking evidence, particularly in this part, this is Hazarajat in central Afghanistan, of Taliban violence. On the other hand, of course, central Afghanistan is also a place of astonishing, for me, uh, kindness and generosity. My ability to walk across Afghanistan was nothing to do with me. It was to do with the hospitality of Afghan villagers who night after night took me in, looked after me, and frequently guided me from one village to another. So this is a photograph of a friend of mine called Dr. Habibullah Sharwal. I turned up in his village. I was walking through. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Kamenj. And he said, oh, just give me a minute. I'll come with you. And he went inside and told his wife, apparently, that he was just going out for a short walk, changed his shoes, picked up his rifle, and he walked with me on what for him would have been a 75-mile round trip. He walked a three-day round trip just to escort me to the next village and then walk back again with no thought of reward. And in fact, in, uh, not even much conversation for him because at that stage my Farsi was pretty ropey. So it was an extremely generous, uh, kind gesture of protection. Here on the other hand is the other side of contemporary Afghanistan. This is the second page of the Interim Afghan National Development Strategy. And I'm putting this up on the board partly in order to tease you because these 58 odd acronyms are very definitional of the way in which the international community categorizes and analyzes Afghanistan at the moment. As you can imagine, the international community is struggling with a very difficult situation. Afghans, of course, themselves are struggling with a much more difficult situation. The situation is a country which is a very poor country. In 2002, it seemed to rank on the United Nations Human Development Index as the third or fourth poorest country in the world. Now, these indexes are obviously very rough and ready, and they don't indicate necessarily things very accurately. But it gives you some idea of a country in which illiteracy rates are extreme, Probably 60, 70 percent of women can't read or write. There is, in many parts of the country, not much fertile soil. It's very difficult to generate sustainable economic growth. 30 years of war destroyed a lot of government structures, destroyed an enormous amount of infrastructure. Afghanistan is starting from a very low base. And in order to both encourage themselves and encourage the donors, there is an attempt to try to talk about what we have achieved in Afghanistan and what we haven't in these kinds of documents. And I'll come back to them a bit later. And I'm going to show them quite quickly because I'm trying to use them more at the moment to indicate the style of the jargon, the style of the language, rather than the particular content. These grand statements, the goal of poverty elimination, creation of wealth, and a respected member of the international community a stable, democratic, financially sustainable state. Now, the points that I wish to make are that that is a pretty tough order. That's a very, very difficult challenge. And I think perhaps as we talk about increasing US involvement in Afghanistan, we need to look at what that challenge actually entails. Also, we need to look at the way the international community looks at Afghanistan, the kind of metrics it applies, the way the international community counts things in Afghanistan, the way they measure things in Afghanistan, the kind of categories under which they analyze it, such as here you can see governance, rule of law, human rights, gender equity, anti-corruption, counter-narcotics. Um, now, stop, just to stop looking at the screen for a second, and just to finish up this small section of the talk,